Uh, Brother Fonzo told me to get through early so he can make it to the Southwestern dinner. I told him I'll take his contribution for him. <laughs> but in John the 11th chapter, and we're going to cover in a very, uh, in a very uh, expeditious way and manner the 47 verses of this text that literally brings us to the climactic moment. Now after this, this, these series will be going into small group curriculum, you know, for your consideration. And we are now at, at the, the seventh message. And the seventh message of this series on the seven signs of divine glory. Now we know that John takes this unique approach. There are so many miracles that are recorded in what is called the Synoptic Gospels. But in this Gospel, John only records seven miracles that were sign miracles. That is, miracles that literally reflected and pointed to the glory that we experience through the personhood of Christ. The other writers, the other gospels, the miracles pointed out his power and his authority as the Messiah, as God, you know, as uh, the man sent from God in terms of his humanity. But in the Gospel of John, John says, I am writing that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It is only in John that we find the I am discourses. That is, discourses that where Jesus literally proclaims himself to be the I am of the old covenant. That is synonymous with Yahweh. God, I will be what I will be. And then in this book, he only chose seven miracles to record that reflects significant components of his divine character. He points to the personhood of Christ. And he tells us in the end that he has a apologetic purpose that is to prove that Jesus is God and he has an evangelistic purpose he says in believing that Jesus is God you might have life through his name so John wants you to experience the life that's promised in gospel faith this miracle of John the 11th chapter brings us to the climactic moment, the climactic sign of the, of the six signs, or of the seven signs. The first sign of glory being the new wine that he offers. The second sign being the living word uh, that brings life. The third sign being his saving grace when he approaches a man that was paralyzed and lain by a pool for 38 long years. He demonstrates the very dynamics of faith that saves. And then uh, in chapter 6, he reveals his divine providence, his ability to supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. He takes a sandwich, two loaves, five loaves and two fish, and he multiplies it and feeds 5,000. 5,000 with 12 baskets left over. And so we see in chapter 6 the divine supply. After that miracle, his disciples goes ahead of him and experiences and enter into a storm. And there we are, we are able to experience the fifth sign of glory, where Jesus comes to them 
in the midst of their storm and makes his presence known. He allows us to understand. Yes, as believers, sometimes we will get ahead of him. Sometimes we go ahead, but he abides faithful. And he chooses often to reveal himself in the midst of our most difficult moments. And then we see in chapter 9, uh, a man that was born blind. And Jesus anoints this man's eyes with, with spittle, or we might say with mud that he made uh, with saliva. Put it in his eyes and told him to go wash. And the Bible says he went and washed and came back seeing. The sign has to do with divine anointing. God anoints us to believe. He anoints us to know his will. He anoints our hearts uh, in order for us to see things that we could not naturally see uh, with our mind's eye. We know that this man, when he was anointed, his first steps was in the dark. But when he obeyed the Lord under the anointing, he came back seeing. And all that miracle is saying is that when you are going through situations, uh, when you are going through difficult moments, uh, God is literally, God can use very difficult situations to work with your heart. He can anoint you make you sensitive and able to hear his word, able to understand his truth. That's why the, that's why the wise men said, he said through mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, not just through the truth, but through mercy in your life. See, it is mercy that prepares you to hear the truth. And that's what is illustrated when the Lord puts the mud in the man's eyes. In other words, makes him uh, literally, if he couldn't see, which he couldn't, he certainly would not be able to see after the Lord put what he put on him. Isn't that right? Sometimes God puts some stuff on you, you know, to confirm your darkness, to confirm and to bring you to the very pits of your darkness. In order that out of the recognition that you don't know what you ought to know, you're willing to learn what you need to learn. Isn't that right? Then we come to this miracle that grows out of a context of unbelief. This miracle is considered climactic for several reasons. Because in this miracle, you're going to see coming together the humanness of Jesus, as well as the divinity of God, the humanity, the affections, the sympathy of God, the uniqueness of the love of God, and yet balanced with his power to bring new life. This, this miracle uh, first features characters and the characters that are introduced in the beginning are significant. I want you to note first the statement of his purpose. Uh, his purpose being stated in verse 4 that he's going to use this sickness. He receives word that a dearly beloved friend is ill. And after receiving this word, the Bible says that Jesus remained where he was for two more days. And after, after receiving this word and remaining where he was, hearing that his beloved friend was sick, 
Here is the key verse. He said, this sickness is not under debt. It's not going to end in debt. He said, but that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So here is a sign of his glory. Now, we're going to see not only the humanity of Jesus coming out of this story, but also his power to triumph over death. Now, I want you to note Job refers to death uh, as the enemy. Uh, as the king, he says, of terror. And what Jesus is going to do in this story is demonstrate his power to bring about life. His power to bring about a resurrection. And he's going to show the resurrection is significant, not just at the end of the age, but resurrection is important to you as a believer right now. Right now. Now, I want you to consider the setting of this. When Jesus ultimately arrives uh, in this town called Bethany, uh, there was a funeral going on. And in ancient funerals, it wasn't like today where there's a service that may last two, three, or the last when I went to five hours. And people are giving eulogies. And people are weeping and bringing their grief to resolution. That's what memorial services are culturally designed to do, allow people to bring closure to the loss of this loved one. Uh, well, in ancient times, it didn't last two or three hours. The mourning, the weeping went on for seven days. People came and literally sat with the family, cried and supported the family for seven days. And if you couldn't weep that long, the family usually would hire professional weepers. They needed to mourn. And they literally hired people who were professional in terms of crying and mourning. And these professional weepers would keep the sadness and the mournfulness going on for a period of seven days. Another thing that's a part of the setting of this is the myths in relationship to death. It was actually taught by rabbis that the spirit that leaves the body would literally hover over a body for about three days before it left for good. And so notice there's a purpose why Jesus delays his coming. There's a purpose why Jesus, after hearing the news, didn't immediately respond. And when he got to Bethany, it was four days into this memorial. The place was called Bethany. Now understand, there are literally two Bethanies in Scripture. Jesus, when he was called and contacted, was in Bethany. But he was in Bethany beyond Paran, beyond the Jordan, which was about a day's journey from where Mary and Martha lived. They were in a little village called Bethany that was about 10 miles outside of Jerusalem. And that little village was called the house of the poor. Bethany literally means the house of the poor. I want you to note the importance of the characters involved. First, Lazarus. In Hebrew terms, it would be Eliezer. It was a common name. 
We see it used twice in the New Testament. I want to get into all of this. You know, the rich man in Lazarus, one was a mythical figure in a fictitious story that Jesus told about life after death. Uh, this other is in this story that's not mythical. It's a real story of a friendship that Jesus had with a particular family. Now, nothing is said about this Lazarus. Only that Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. We know about the other two members, Mary and Martha. Because one day Jesus had visited them before. And you remember, Martha was that energetic one, the busy one, the, 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 the one that was in the kitchen and taking care of everything. And Mary was the one that was always sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha complaining, why don't you tell her to come and help me out? Jesus said, well, Mary has chosen the good part. The story tells us that this family is that family that Jesus had visited. This Mary is the Mary that came into the home of Simon the Pharisee and literally washed the feet of Jesus with her tears. She's that one that Jesus spoke of as being spiritually feeling indebted because of his grace and because of experiencing his forgiveness. She was found herself prostrated before the Lord all the time. And on the first occasion, shedding tears, wiping the feet of Jesus with her tears. Are you following me? Notice this Mary, uh, the Bible says, Jesus loved Mary and Martha. Notice in the message for Mary to Jesus concerning the brother, they said, Lazarus, your friend, is sick. The one who is a beloved friend is sick. Are you following me? Uh, he uses the word phileo, which means natural love. A brotherly type of love. But in verse 5, where the Bible says that Jesus loved Mary and Martha, it demonstrated a divine relationship. In other words, Lazarus uh, was... Basically, a beloved friend. The sisters were two believing sisters who had encountered and come to faith in Jesus Christ. The context would suggest that the disciples, they're the other characters, they are the ones whose eyes are being spiritually anointed. To understand and be able to see the glory of Christ. Keep in mind, that's what, the, that's what that sign of the blind man in the previous chapter was about. How God anoints our eyes. Enables us to see his glory. See his will. Well, the disciples, when they got the message, and Jesus says, uh, Lazarus is asleep. They didn't understand what he was talking about. He said, let's go and awake him. He said, what are you talking about? If he's asleep, isn't that a good thing? You know, why would we want to wake him if he's falling asleep and he's sick? Don't he need his rest? Their eyes are being anointed. Then there's another character that's significant. His name is Didymus. He's Thomas. You hear, you'll hear about him uh, in the future. He's the one that says, I'm not going to believe until I see the hands, until I feel the print. Isn't that right? Thomas was impetuous. Isn't that right? Thomas, in this story, 
He was the courageous pessimist. When Jesus said, let's go and raise him. I'm going to go and raise him. And Thomas said to the disciples, y'all, let's come on, let's go. And let's die with him. Isn't that right? Which one of you want to be Thomas next week? Courageous pessimist. We're going to have some Thomases here. Come and see who the Thomases are. Now notice, uh, notice. And so the first principle that I want you to notice about this story that relates to the sign is that he delays his coming to achieve his purposes. Now notice the text says, therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold he whom you love. They sent to him literally a cryptic message. But the message was clear. The message acknowledged faith. The message expressed urgency. They petitioned him. And the Bible says that Jesus, when he heard that, he said this sickness is not going to end in death. In other words, death is not going to get the victory. He said, but it's going to be far the glory of God. And then I want you to note, the text says uh, that after he had gotten the message, he, the Bible says, stayed where he was. Notice when he got this message, the Bible says, now Jesus what loved Mary and Bapha. Now, he's bringing the tension into this. You see, sometimes when we petition the Lord, we find ourselves in circumstances, very difficult circumstance, and we call on God. And we think, we wonder sometimes why haven't he answered. Isn't that right? Because often, according to his will, he will delay his coming. That's called, coming there is the term parousia, uh, his appearance. We look for his coming. But notice the coming of Christ uh, is often in a very practical and personal way. Sometimes we look for his coming in the end when we need his coming right now. Isn't that right? Have you ever been in a situation that seems urgent to you. My loved one is sick and I'm calling urgently. I'm praying to the Lord. Lord, I need your help right now. Isn't that right? We form petitions. Uh, they sent him a message. They called him Lord. That shows faith. They said, behold, that says that this is urgent. You're, the one you love, they're saying it demands your attention right now. And the Bible says Jesus loved Mary and Martha. So when he heard that he was sick, he did what? He stayed two more days. Can you imagine? How does that sound? What, 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 what are you suggesting? They petitioned, they sent him a very crypt. Lord, behold, this demands response. And the Bible says, he stayed, he stayed two more days. That would anger. It angers some of us. Isn't that right? It angers some of us, you know, if, if you didn't show up. Did you get this message? Did you hear this message? Did you get this, Brother Jones? <laughs> the point is, but this is Jesus, and he is delaying. You know why? Because first of all, he has a higher purpose. 
in the right. So you have to understand that sometimes God, uh, he, sometimes God would delay his coming to you. Not that he's not coming because his coming is always going to be on time. You got to know that. He answers your prayer. He answers your petition. And his petition and his response is always going to be timely. But understand this. is going to be based upon higher purposes. Not simply the purpose that we may petition for. Oh Lord, you know, I need help. My bills are due. You know, my, my, my health is failing. Lord, my loved one is dying. Lord, they need your help right now. But God says, I have a higher purpose. I have a deeper love. And I'm on a divine timetable and not yours. Isn't that right? You know what he, he, he responded? He said there are 12 hours of the day. That's right. He says, and anyone who walks in the day, he says, anyone who walks in the day, uh, he does not stumble because he sees the light. You know what he's really important to? When you walk in harmony with God's will, when you're on God's timetable and you live in your life in harmony with his will, you're not going to stumble. That's right. You don't have to worry about error. You're going to be on time. You're going to be timely. And notice he says, but if anyone walks in the dark because he's, in other words, if anyone walks in the dark, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Friends, you, are, you need to know God's will. And in order for you to understand the divine actions of God, when you are calling on him in urgent need, it matters not how urgent your bills are. It matters not how the pain that you feel that he needs to respond to because pain always Proceed promise. Misery always come before, before miracle. The blessing don't come before the burden. Isn't that right? You need to understand those things. But when you understand God's will, I want you to understand uh, that he's operating according to his divine purposes. And he's operating in a way for you to see his glory. One of the reasons that Jesus delayed his coming is because it was needful according to his ultimate purpose uh, for Lazarus to be undisputably dead. That's right. In other words, he needed Lazarus in order for them to see the glory of God, in order for God to be glorified in this circumstance. He needed to, be, to wait until it was undeniable that this man was dead. Isn't that right? And sometimes God is not going to respond to you until you die. Sometimes God is not going to bring the power of his resurrection until you figure out the fact that you've done everything that you can do and you can't solve the problem. Until you stop fighting and stop wrestling with God in terms of his purpose. Until you become willing to allow God to be glorified in this circumstance. He's going to delay because you ain't ready yet. Because he said, except the corn of wheat fall to the earth and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it's going to bring forth fruit. Isn't that right? God wants you to be fruitful. And in order for you to be fruitful, God has got to be glorified when he brings life and resurrection to you. Isn't that right? And so the Bible said when he heard about this illness, he delayed three more days. And the reason three more days is because, see, the rabbis could have said that, you know, the spirit was still hovering. <laughs> that spirit was still hovering. And he was just in like a comatose state. And so after the third day, they had no explanation of that. And so the point is, it was necessary for Lazarus to be declared and understood to be completely dead. Ah. Now, here's the principle. I don't, I don't have time to explain that proverb. That was a proverb when the Lord said, the man who walks in the dark, 
You know, and what he's basically saying in that proverb is you can't add to your time and you can't go govern when the night going to come. That's right. God is in charge of all of it. And so you need to recognize God's purposes. And then the second principle is he declares his character to reveal his plans. You see, in other words, he delays his coming. The Bible says to accomplish, to achieve his purposes. And then he declares his character. Noted before he did the miracle, he had to first let Mary and Martha know who he is. Oh, y'all going to get this. You see, sometimes as believers, we struggle with the concept of his divinity. We struggle with Christ because of our own humanness. It is hard for us to embrace the concept that we are serving a God who's literally infinite, who God is almighty and omnipotent. We are serving a God who's all-powerful. We struggle with that. Even when we think we confessed it, and even when we think we believe it, we're still in practice struggling with it. Notice, Jesus said to her, your brother's going to rise again. When they heard that Jesus was coming, they, they rushed out, and he told her, he said, Mary, Martha, Martha's the one who ran out of the kitchen. Martha's the one who ran down the road. Mary's still being nonchalant. She's there at home with the, with the weepers and the mourners. But Martha heard that Jesus was coming, and she ran down the road. And that's right, she ran to meet him. He was not yet in the village, but she ran to meet him. And you know what she said? She said, if I know he would rise again. But in verse 21, did I miss verse 21? Somewhere I missed verse 21. Verse 21 said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have done. Do you not know that Jesus reveals his personhood in order to grow our faith? In other words, sometimes when we're going through these difficult moments and the reason he delays and, 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 and re to achieve his purposes and the reason we have to know and understand his personhood is because we're still at a level of faith where we cannot see yet the divine glory. Are you following me? And so she came and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Notice, she said, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection day. Yes. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He didn't say, I will be the resurrection. He didn't say, I will be the life. He says, I am the resurrection. You're dealing with the I am. Not the I will be, I am. And notice he says, he who believes in me and who else ever lives and believes in me, he shall never die. Do you believe this? Notice, she said, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe you came into the world. And I believe that he'll rise in the latter day. You know what's wrong with that? You see, her in time theology, we call it eschatology. Her eschatology, that is in time faith, had no in time realities. <laughs> Did you get me? See, eschatology means end of time. In other words, she had an end of time hope with no in time expectation. And that's inadequate faith. When you have an end of time hope, that is I'm hoping to go to heaven. I'm hoping that I ain't gonna see hell. I'm hoping not to see death. I'm hoping all, oh, I'm hoping to see God when I die. I'm hoping to have a mansion, to have a room prepared for me. I'm hoping for all of the, I'm hoping sooner, to, sooner we'll be done with the troubles of this world. You got an end of time expectation with no end time expectations. That's problematic 
because that kind of faith responds to a natural expression of faith in which your faith, your Christology, that is your understanding of Christ, your view of Christ. Notice, I don't know how I left it, those verses, but that, that Christology of her, she had an accurate Christology. Yes, I believe you're the son of God. We confess that. I believe you're the son of God, and I believe you came into the world, and I believe my brother's going to rise at the last day. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection. You see, correct Christology with inadequate eschatology, that is in time hope, makes your faith impotent. You got to have some right now expectations because the hope that Jesus gives and offers us, the Bible said, is a lively hope. The Bible said the mystery of the Christian hope is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You want to see the glory of God, you got to have some end time expectations. They want to be raised in the last day, but you don't want to be raised out of your death and destruction and depravity in this day. There's some stuff going on in your life. You want to escape hell in the last day and going through hell right now. And the Lord is trying to tell you, I am the resurrection. Are you following me? He said, I'm the resurrection. He said, I am the life. And anyone believes in me, though he be dead, he's going to live. Isn't that right? Oh, I wish I had I wish I had time. The Christian hope provides and some end time expectations. Lord, I'm not just looking for your coming at the end of time. I'm looking for your coming now. And I know you may be delaying your coming. That's why I'm going to read and try to understand your purposes. And when I can understand your purposes, then I can see your glory. Isn't that right? When you act, I can see your glory. Notice some of them. Now, I want you to notice the other struggle here. See, sometimes we struggle to really understand his power and his passion. In other words, we've got to hold in tension the power of God. He has the power to raise the sick. He has the power to raise us from our detriment. And not only power, but the Bible says he loves. Notice the Bible said, the Bible said Jesus wept. And when they saw him weeping, you know what they said? Some of them said, let's go back here in verse 35. Jesus wept and then the Jews said, see how much he loved him? Do you see how much he loved him? And then notice the, the perplexity. They said, could this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? See, that's the perplexity. How could someone who has such power allow this person to be in this condition? That's the perplexity. See, that's what we struggle with. And that's what Jesus comes in order to expand our faith, in order to grow our understanding. How can this man who is God, and see, let me tell you something. What they were also saying and suggesting, how can this man who have done the things that we've heard, he's opened the eyes of the blind. That was in the last chapter. See, the blind man was no friend. He was, just, he was just a stranger. How could he do for strangers more than what he do for believers? Hey, that's a problem. Isn't that right? How can he do for an unbeliever? And not do the same for a believer. They didn't understand it. And we struggle with it. Isn't that right? And so Jesus says, Jesus says, look. But Mary had, you know, Martha was smart. Martha came back and said, look. Yes, even now though. <laughs> you got to have them even now faith. Yeah, I, I realize that you're late and I realize that you didn't come when I expected you. I realize that it seems like you're not on time, but even now. 
even now. I realize the doctors have said that this thing is over with. I realize the doctors have declared this to be terminal. I realize the doctors have given up and even some family members may have given up. But Mary Martha said, but even now. <laughs> I don't know who I'm preaching to. But somebody might be getting this. Yeah. The last part, he, dis he, dis he displays his power to confirm his promise. See, when he raised Lazarus, that was a display of his glory, a display of his power. Of he declared himself, he said, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. Come on, Mary. I'm the re Come on, Martha. I'm the resurrection and I am the life. And he said, if you just believe, isn't that right? Now notice the Bible says, then Jesus was groaning in himself. I don't have time to deal with that because that this is a whole, that'd be a whole sermon. And the Bible says he came to the tomb and it was a cave and a stone was against it. And he said to them, take away the stone. Let me tell you something. Before, see there are two, let me tell you something. In order for you to experience divine glory, do you not know you got a part? And God got a part. Do you not know that God don't do for you what you can do for yourself? God never does for believers what believers can do. And so when he comes to this tomb, the first thing the Bible said, there was a stone laid up against the tomb. You know what that stone was for? Number one, it was for to keep animals out. Number two, it was to keep the stench in, the smell in. And number three, it kept out grave robbers. That's, what, that's right. And so the point is, the Bible said when he came to the cave, there was a stone again. And he told them, take away the stone. You know what you can do? You can take away the stone. <laughs> oh, yes, you can. See, sometimes you, can't, you have to be willing by faith to clear the path for God to do his thing. You see, you have to open the door. You have to clear the path. And sometimes there are stones that are keeping people in their graves. There are stones that are keeping people in bondage. And you've got to be willing to roll away that stone. Yeah, there's some blockers. There's, there's, some, there's some grave guards that sometimes you need to get. I'm dealing with this. I know. Trying to help somebody overcome drugs and alcohol and you got folk who are just bringing them and just bringing it every every other day to show up with another bottle show up with another pill I found out their number I put 69 by mine and I called them I said you bring another one over here <sighs> you bring another bottle to this house the point is, you've got to be willing to roll away the stone. That's, that's your part. Let me tell you what your part is because Jesus is also going to deal with our part because he now, keep in mind, the church is the embodiment of Christ. Isn't that right? We speak the words of Christ. And so you better watch him because you need to watch how the body of Christ should act in these circumstances. Remove the stone. And when you remove the stone, you also have to be willing to face up to the stench. Faith will take you into some stinky places. That's right. People have been doing this stuff for so long, and, and let me tell you, they smell. Oh, yes, I wish I could tell you. I can't tell you everything. But the point is, you will be dealing with the stench of what it means to be dead spiritually for so long. Isn't that right? So to remove the stone is to remove the obstacle, to clear the path and be ready to face up to the stench. And then the Bible says, when Jesus prayed, I want you to listen to what Jesus prayed. Now notice, Martha had let her know that it's been, let him know, he said, this man's been dead for four days. Do you not know that he's stinking now? And Jesus said, did I say to you, did I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Don't worry about how long it's been. Don't worry about what, what others are saying. And don't worry about what you're going to face. Just do what I tell you to do. Roll the stone away. 
you're going to see the glory of God. And they took away the stone. And notice the Bible said Jesus prayed. And I want you to notice something in his prayer. There's no petition in this prayer. He didn't ask God, God, I want you to give me the power to raise this man from the dead. There ain't no petition. He said, the only reason I'm saying these words is for the benefit of those who say, he said, I, I know you hear me. You have always heard me. He said, I'm only saying that you're hearing me for the benefit of those that stand by. You have got to be willing in your trouble, in your circumstance, in your difficulty. You got to be willing to seek the benefit. How can my circumstance, how can this circumstance bring about the glory of God? For the benefit of those who stand by. Isn't that right? Knowing that prayer is always to be in harmony with God's will. The Holy Spirit always prays, Romans 8, in harmony with God's will. Jesus always prayed in harmony with God's will. And the child of God, the Bible said, whatsoever you ask, according to his will, he's going to grant it. So he's going to grant it. Ain't no maybe, ain't no arbitrary, he's going to grant it. Now notice... Notice, uh, the Bible said, now when he had the, he said these things, he cried with a loud voice. If you could read this in the Greek, it says, with a loud voice, he cried loud. That sounds strange, doesn't it? You know, but it just says here in the English translation, with a loud voice, he cried, and he only used two words. There are only two words in the Greek here. One is Lazarus. You know why he said Lazarus? There were other dead folk in there. He didn't want the general resurrection. <laughs> it wasn't time. I can imagine his word going forth. The Bible said going forth in that tomb. Huh? No, not you, not you, not you, but you. <laughs> yeah. The word went right on to Lazarus. Because he called Lazarus by name. And the other word is little bird that says, come forward. That's right, come forward. And they, you know, Lazarus came forth. He had grave clothes on. They had wrapped him like a mummy. And I don't know how he got out of there. I don't know if he was hopping. You know, I, don't, I, I, don't know, I, I don't know how he came forth. You know, they may have just wrapped one leg at a time. He could have walked out like a dead man. And I know the song that says, I'm going to call you three times. That's, that song sounds good, Aretha, but it ain't biblical. <laughs> it ain't biblical. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And you know the point is, when it comes to the embodiment of Christ in the church, we must be willing to say what we believe and, and say it out loud. You know, a lot of times we want to believe something, but we don't tell others. We ain't going to say nothing to nobody else. You know why we don't want to say nothing? Because if it don't happen, we don't want people to go, uh-huh, I know you, you, you're afraid about that. See, what you're willing to say, the Bible said evidence of what you really believe. Isn't that right? Jesus said to them in Matthew 17, when they could not cast the spirit of leprosy, uh, uh, of epilepsy out of this young man. The Bible said, Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say unto you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain. You got to be willing to say it, and you got to be willing to say it out loud. Isn't that right? Yes! Now that's your part. Let me tell you what God's part is. God reveals to us. The Lord reveals to us in his word. I'm finished now. The Lord reveals to us in his word. The word of faith. That's right. That's what the scripture is. All the promises of God, the Bible says, are yes, in Christ Jesus. Those are the words of faith. And not, and not only is his part to reveal the word, but do you not know his part is also to energize the word? That's right. You can say, if you say stuff you don't believe, it ain't going to have no energy. That's right. You get up here and pray and, pray and use all those accolades and almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all that, don't even know what you're saying. You've got to say words of faith. And you have to recognize that God reveals that. And not only does he reveal it, he will energize it, that it will accomplish what he wills. And here's one more thing. Here's one more thing. 
Now notice the Bible says, and when he had, and when he who had died came forth, hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with the cloth. Here's the second after the glory. You know what you got to be willing to do? Unwrap. That's right. Help them take off the grave, grave, grave clothes. See, some Christians still walking around in grave clothes. <laughs> they still look like they looked when they were in the dead. Oh, Lord, have mercy. There's so much in here. But the Bible said, see, the, the Lord didn't do that. Because that wasn't his part. His, my part is the word. Your part is to remove the stone. Isn't that right? Your part is to face up to the stench. Your part is to unwrap and take away the grave clothes and let him go. That's what our parts are. Are you willing to do your part? When it comes to helping somebody that you're praying for. Are you willing to do your part when it comes to delivering somebody that you want to be saved? Are you willing to help remove the stones that's blocking their path? You willing to put in that kind of time? And then when God delivers, are you going to let them con continue to walk around in grave clothes? Stand on your feet. Because here's the last thing. There's one more point, and that's verse 45. The Bible says that then many of the Jews had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did. They believed in him. You know, when God displays his glory, you've got to be willing to celebrate the end results. That's right, because he does it for worship. He enables you to worship. You got you to gotta celebrate that deliverance. You got to celebrate the fact that he answered that prayer. You got to celebrate the fact that he energized his word. You got to celebrate the fact that when he was glorified, there were others who stood by and saw and saw his glory. You got to recognize the fact that when you're going through a difficult moment and you're praying and it seems like the Lord is delaying, you got to recognize the fact that it ain't just about you. God is going to be glorified through this. And so after all of it is said and done, celebrate the end result. If you're here today and you're a child of God who have erred from the fellowship of the church, we we invite you to be restored. If you hear you're not a Christian and you want to become a Christian, we invite you to respond. To respond to who Jesus is. Make that confession that you believe that Jesus is God's son. And then be willing to be obedient. That is, as the, the blind man was told, go wash. And the Bible said be baptized for the remission of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of his spirit. Make that decision right now as our worship singers invite you to respond to the Lord.